Welcome to Municipal Affairs. I'm your host, Christopher Brown. In today's episode, we are shining a spotlight on a pivotal moment as Alberta's government unveils Bill 20, a landmark legislation poised to redefine the landscape of transparency, accountability, and accessibility in local elections, according to the province. In any democratic society, the cornerstone of trust lies in the integrity of our electoral process and the accountability of our elected officials. Now, according to the province, with Bill 20, the government seeks to uphold these fundamental principles, ensuring that Albertans can rely on transparent, free, and fair elections, while also demanding clear measures of accountability from municipally elected representatives. The Municipal Affairs Statutes Amendment Act encompasses amendments to both the Local Authorities Elections Act and the Municipal Government Act. Now, according to the Municipal Affairs Minister, the Honourable Rick McIver, these proposed reforms aim to enhance transparency in local election processes, empower voters, and safeguard the integrity of the democratic process. So, to shed light on the significance and the implications of Bill 20, we are honoured to have that minister on today's show, Alberta's Municipal Affairs Minister, Rick McIver for a one-on-one interview where we will get into the insights into the motivations behind the proposed amendments, as well as the potential impact on Alberta's local governance, and offer his valuable insights into the proposed legislation. So stay tuned, as this is Municipal Affairs. Minister, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. I want to start by getting your initial comments on the Municipal Affairs Statute Amendment Act that you proposed or introduced last Thursday. What is this bill aiming to fix? Well, it's aiming to uh, fix a number of things. Uh, Every four years, there's a municipal election. So uh, in municipal affairs, somewhere in the halfway point, which is about where we are right now, uh, we look at Uh, what went well in the last election, what went poorly, what improvements might uh, be appropriate, and we try to put that in place. That's what we're doing now. Somewhere around four years from now, I or whoever has my job then will probably put another bill forward. It may look exactly like this or may look completely different, but it'll be based on whatever the learnings are after the next municipal election. So this is a regularly uh, scheduled and a regular cycle thing that we do. Uh, We are recording, Heather, so we're just going to continue on with the conversation. I'm just going to cut that part out. Um, Since the introduction of Bill 20 uh, last Thursday, uh, Alberta municipal leaders from across the province, both rural and urban leaders, have been voicing their concerns about this. Are you surprised at the sort of comments that you've been hearing or were you anticipating some of the backlash that you were expecting from the... You know, I thought I'd hear a little bit, but, but let me be clear. Not all municipal leaders are against this. The ones that are for it are uh, quieter, not calling press conferences. They're just phoning me up and saying, I like it. So, uh, but clearly they're not all in favor of it, uh, which, which is, I, I, I think, um, what I think I've heard from uh, the, the leaders uh, in media conferences where they're complaining is that they want to be consulted. Uh, right when we introduced the legislation, it made it very clear they're all going to be consulted on the regulations. Uh, so the answer is yes. Um, and, and, uh, that's a commitment that we made right when we rolled out the, uh, the legislation that, listen, there, any change should make people nervous. That's, uh, because you, until you understand it fully. So that's normal. So I will uh, make the effort to try to get around to talk to the municipal leaders that are concerned and, and, uh, hear what they have to say. And perhaps we'll solve some of this before the legislation gets passed. So let's let's dive into some of the issues that uh, I've been hearing about, but also you talked about in your opening press conference last Thursday when you introduced the bill. Uh, I want to start right off the top about political parties. Now, you and I have chatted about this uh, in the previous episode of the show, and you said that Political parties have always been there, and I would agree that they probably have always been there. They're just putting a a name to the actual uh, situation here a little bit. Um, The concern that I've been hearing is you're picking on Edmonton and Calgary, but you're saying that this is a test sort of uh, run to see how they are introduced. Why choose Edmonton and Calgary to first start off the line of questioning around political parties' introduction into municipal politics? 
Well, it seems like a logical place to start. They're the two uh, biggest and, uh, you know, hot, most population municipalities. And in my view, the ones where political party activity is most overt, the, the two where you can make the best case that political parties already uh, are there and already active. I mean, if I was to uh, ask you a question, um, if a municipal election was held and seven or eight people running were supported uh, by with over a million dollars by a union group and a bunch of other members were supported by hundreds of thousands of dollars by business people. Um, doesn't that sound just a little bit like a political party system? Uh, and yet there's no rules around it. So all we're doing really, if you could, for those that say they don't want political parties, they should actually sort of be cheering for this because right now it's the wild west. Any municipality in Alberta can have political party like activities and there are no rules. There are no restrictions. Uh, so if it, you know, walks like a duck and talks like a duck, maybe it might be a duck. Um, so yeah, so we're just going to put some rules around fairly normal political party ish rules around it, you know, uh, controlling spending, controlling, uh, uh fundraising, uh, putting uh, limits on those things, uh, a little more accountability in terms of so people when they go to vote will have a chance to, if they want to to find out who their candidate got their money from and uh, attach whatever value proposition that they choose to attach to that and uh yeah i, I think uh people have given people more information about uh who's who they vote for is getting supported by i i, I view it as a positive thing and, and hopefully i most albertans will also view it that way so one of the things that I noticed after this was it still doesn't address some sort of the rural municipalities and the smaller communities. You've said that it's been there and it's probably there in smaller communities as well, but we're starting yeah. off with Calgary and Edmonton. So are you saying that political parties, if someone wishes, they want to run a political slate in Chestermere or Cochrane or up in the regional wood, uh, regional municipality, Wood Buffalo, they would be able to do that in this upcoming election? Or are you saying no yeah, to there's that? No, there's no, no, this isn't, believe me, this is not introducing political yeah. parties. This is limited, This is actually limiting political parties. Uh, somebody, listen, and, and to be clear, the political parties are most overt in the bigger cities. And there's many small municipalities that could say, and many, some of them are right, that say we don't have any real legitimate political party activity here. And in many small municipalities, I would believe that. Um, but not, in the big cities, uh, I, I, there could be people say they ran in the last election uh, in a big city and they had no political leanings, no affiliation, no like uh, money, monetary support. And okay, there's probably people that that's true about, but there's also <laughs> um, several that got a lot of money from um, the same groups and, and they didn't do anything wrong. Like there was just no rules around it. There's no limits to it. And and let me just say this, if, if we went back that way in, in uh, the legislature and said, well, let's just, we're gonna uh, allow people to run in a political party, we're just gonna take all the rules away. Albertans would lose their mind uh, in a very negative way. And yet uh, putting the same rules or similar rules, at least uh, around municipal elections as we have around the provincial elections, somehow is the end of the world. I, I, I don't believe that. Um, I think most Albertans don't believe that. Uh, I, I think if they don't understand it well enough, then I'll take the blame for I haven't explained it well enough yet. But that's part of the reason I'm on the air with you. It's part of the reason I said right when I was introducing the legislation that I, I uh, commit to uh, working with and meeting with the uh, municipalities and consulting them on the regulations that will uh, guide and, and give action to this legislation. So you you were an alderman and a councillor for the city of Calgary for a few years. Uh, I have got to sort of ask the stupid question, but the important one, do you wish you would have had a political party to run under when you were a municipal leader? Or do you look back on that and say, OK, maybe if we had them, we'd be able to get a little bit more done from my perspective or just from your perspective like, as you a former municipal leader? Maybe. Uh, no, but here's the thing. <laughs> Uh, life's too short for regrets. You, you do what you do. You operate the best you can. You win some, you lose some. I don't wake up every day and say, oh gosh, I wish I'd never lost it. If I did that, God, my life would be terrible. I, 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 uh, I move on. Um, it, would it, that have helped me? I don't know. 
here's what I think. I know this is what I find funny too. I get some people saying, well, this is a partisan thing to get more conservatives elected. Well, here's what I've kind of noticed uh, in uh, municipal elections in the big cities is that the uh, somebody of a, the left wing, if you will, or a left side persuasion runs, everybody lines up before them and votes for them. Uh, a person on the right side lines up and then three more people on the right say, I could do a better job than her or a better job than him. And you got four candidates on the right and one on the left and the one on the left wins because their vote's not split all over the place. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised at the same. I don't know what will happen, obviously, in the future, but it wouldn't surprise me if you have one left wing party and four right wing parties and, <laughs> and the one on the left wins again, because that's uh, just uh, the nature of the beast, I, I think. But that that is not why we're doing this. But but I but I uh, if you're looking for a prediction for me, we'll have one left wing party and three or four right wing parties and the one on the left will probably win. But that's not. I'm not doing this to help the one on the left win, and I'm not doing this to help the one on the right win. I'm just just trying to put some reasonable rules around what I believe is already happening. Um, you in your press conference during the introduction of Bill 20, you talked about how none of these municipal political parties in Edmonton or Calgary will be aligned with any provincial or federal party. There will not yeah. be sharing. There might be people who are in conjunction yeah. with them. The yeah. member of the UCP <laughs> might be a party of that. Uh, was that a conscious decision to make sure that yes. Yes. the political parties provincially stay out of municipal government? Listen, here's what I do believe is local politics need to be local. So we explicitly for are forbidding any uh, municipal political party to be uh, officially affiliated or monetarily affiliated with a federal or uh, or provincial party. Now, provincial liberals or may door knock with the NDP looks like a liberal candidate. Um, provincial NDPs might door knock with what looks like a municipal NDP candidate and provincial. Uh, Conservative candidates may door knock what looks like a so that's not like you got to be able to go and door knock and support a candidate, but can't share money, can't share lists, can't share resources. Local politics need to stay local. Two of the things that I've talked to a few CAOs in the last few days since the introduction of this bill was the fact that you the province is taking back the recall legislation, uh, the checks and balances, if you will, and the CAO of local municipalities will not be uh, involved in that process anymore because – as as you know, there's only one employee for council, and that's the CAO or city manager. Um, you're getting a lot of praise around from CAOs around that part of the bill. Why was that well, important for the for the province to say, okay, we see an issue, we're going to take it away from the municipalities and bring it into the provincial jurisdiction? Yeah, well, this, thank you, and I should be getting praise for that because the CAOs from across the province, even the, even the ones without a recall, said, "Do not put me in that position." You know, a city council is essentially my boss, and all or part of city council has a recall petition, and I have to cast judgment on my boss on whether the recall petition was legitimate or not. That's not fair. It's not right. And and yes, that's it isn't fair and it isn't right. So that was relatively easy to fix and, and we're fixing it. I'll tell you what, but what isn't fixed in this bill that we're going to consult on further uh, because we have time because recall can't take place till at least 18 months after the next election. So now we got 18 months till the next election, another 18 months after that till the first recall can happen. So, so we got three years. So I'm, we're using that three years to talk to people because where we have not come to a decision is on what the right threshold is to launch a, th uh, a a petition for a recall. I think generally speaking, um, people believe as frankly I do, that the current threshold is too high in the big cities and it's too small in the small municipalities. So at the, at the level where the recall is now, I would say to you that it's very, very difficult in the view when you got to get hundreds of thousands of signatures like in 30 days, very, very difficult. On the other hand, if you and I were close friends and we lived in the same municipality and we were both politically active and kind of had some experience door knocking uh, in a municipality of, I don't know, 1,500 people, uh, what's 80% of, of that is like 1,200 people. I think you and I in two, three good weekends could hit the doors <laughs> and, and maybe cause it like that seems too easy. Do you know what I mean? If, if two grumpy guys can make it happen in two or three weekends, it seems too easy. 
and yet it's almost impossible in a big city. So I don't know where the line is, but we're going to get some advice on that because, well, we genuinely, genuinely did kind of throw a lot of things around about what thought we thought might actually be accepted by the public as reasonable. We just couldn't land anywhere. So we're going to get advice. And the one thing that I've been hearing uh, while we're talking about recall for a second is how do you deal with acclamations, right? How do you deal with someone who's been acclaimed to the position? Because some of these smaller municipalities, uh, the municipal councillors are acclaimed because no one runs against them. So how do you recall someone who's been acclaimed? Do you just have to go out and get no signatures? So that's something that. I yeah, just, yeah. No, I, right. No. And I'm where I was acclaimed once. I don't know if you yeah. knew that or not on, on Calgary Council. Um, so. Yeah, so we obviously we're gonna have to figure out something other than percentage of voters there because either got to call the percentage a hundred or call it zero or you got to set some other extent. And I'm not presuming if if I knew what the answer was, that might be included in this legislation. But I definitely don't know what the answer is. So we're committed to going out and getting advice. But what this bill does do allows the cabinet to uh, unilaterally by a vote in cabinet to potentially remove a councillor or a mayor um, from the elected office. You said in your introduction, this is the sort of last resort. You would not want to use it because they're duly elected. Why put it in then? Why put something in that is a last resort when you have the legislation already through the MGA? Well, we do actually see. Thank you for saying that, because what uh, one I remember one one media outlet, I don't know who it was, called this sweeping new powers. Sounds kind of ominous when you say it like that, doesn't it? Sweeping new powers. Um, these are sweeping powers, but they are not new. The provincial government in Alberta and I believe every other province in Canada has the ability to remove councillors, has the ability to wind back municipal legislation, has the ability to wind back municipal uh, planning regulations. It's, it's, these are not new powers. There's a shorter distance between thinking about it and doing it. I agree with that. But, but actually, if you look at it from the public standpoint, which is I hope people are, and I'll, I'll present this for you, is that what it hasn't changed is at the end of whatever process we have, we still count ca our uh, cabinet has to make a decision. That's the same. Now, what happens before the cabinet decision is potentially shorter, could be just as long. The minister and cabinet could decide to go through a whole process or if the, if the situation is severe enough, they could cut to the chase, if you will. But it's a power that's already there. But what's more important to me is that whether you go through a long process or not, um, once you make that decision, the public has a right to know why, and they will ask. And people like you in the media and other and other people in the media will make a point of asking relentlessly until they get some kind of an answer, which is fine. That's doing your job. I don't have a problem with that. So, and I would say to you, uh, what was presented to me was what's stopping, even if you won't do it. McIver, what's stopping the next minister or the next political party from doing it? I would say this: what's stopping them is the same thing that's stopping me. If I was to come out tomorrow and say I'm firing Chris Brown because he's not a conservative, I my political career would be over. Like, it would. And, all, and if all of cabinet signed on to that, their political careers would be over too. So the NDP won't do this. They may want to, but they won't. And for those that say we may want to, the biggest reason we don't, I don't want to, but the biggest reason is that I think we'd pay a terrible price for it. Plus, it still has uh, recourse to the courts. And, it, and, and even with the longer process, it uh, was not that many years ago, a council was dismissed and that decision was overturned, I think, within 24 or 40 hours, eight hours in the courts right, right now. Yeah. So that will still be there. So the whole idea there's no recourse, there's no fail safe. No, it's just not true. It's just not true. There, there is the legal recourse, which can act very quickly in, in cases like this. And there's the political recourse that you could have 22 people and their political careers on the same day if they were really crazy with the decision they make. So the one last area I want to talk about before I wrap up is I'm cautious of time and I just realized what we're at the 15 minute mark here and I don't you have a busy day ahead of you but I want to talk about the bylaw of repeal and amendment from the cabinet as well. Um, RMA, Alberta municipalities has said this will uh, give the province and the cabinet control over local democracy and local sort of bylaws, and they will lose their autonomy in some sense. What do you, how do you respond to RMA and Alberta municipalities well, saying that you're going to basically control what they can do and what they can't do now? 
We already do. We just choose not to do it. That We already have that control. At the end of COVID, when the city of Edmonton, when we took away the masking bylaw and the city of Edmonton decided they were going to, going to uh, knowingly against our wishes, act like the health department and, and, and put a masking bylaw in Edmonton, we actually, I actually had to put a piece of legislation in the house to overturn their decision. Okay. And you, you might say, well, that wasn't that inconvenient. You got it done pretty quick. Sure we did. Cause, well, sure we did. Cause the house was sitting. But what if some municipality does something unfortunate in the middle of summer and the house isn't going to sit again for three months? Then some crazy rule has to stay in place for three, four months, or you got great expense and inconvenience to everybody. And expense, remember, always goes to the taxpayer. You got to recall the legislature in June or July um, and overturn a municipal bylaw. So what that thing in Edmonton taught me was that, well, we got away with it then because the House happened to be said, it just occurred to me, what would happen if this was the first of June and the House wasn't going to sit again until the last week in October? Wow. Like you're talking, and, and it might, people might say, well, I don't feel sorry for politicians that they got to work in the summer. Fair enough. But remember, you're paying the bill for it, Mr. and Mrs. Taxpayer. And not only the politicians, but the staff have to be there. The security, the, the clerks, everybody. And some of them may have vacations that legitimately plan months or a year ahead with thousands and thousands of dollars and all that could, might have to go away. It's, it's the, the most important thing is uh, I think is that two things is that if the legislation is used lightly, flippantly, um, uh, it can actually, even if it's used soberly and carefully, it can still be challenged in court. The difference is if it's used carefully, there's a better chance it'll win in court if you overturn it. But the fact is, if it don't, you still get that embarrassment uh, of to cabinet if, if they're making silly decisions, whether it's uh conservative government or an NDP government or liberal government all would be under that same pressure. And also uh, the fail safe of legal action is always there. And, and uh, so okay. for people to say uh, you could do this easily and often without any consequences, it's, it's not so. I, I'm going to play a little bit of devil's advocate with you for my last question, because I, I, I've, spoken to th I played, I've spoken to three different rural municipal leaders in the last 24 hours about Bill 20, just preparing for this interview, but also getting their reactions as well. Sure. And they, they kept on coming back to what Bill 20 is trying to do to municipalities is basically what the province is accusing Justin Trudeau of doing to the provinces. Do you agree with that? Would you say that you're trying to control what the municipalities are doing, just like Justin Trudeau is trying to control what the provinces are doing? Uh, well, I would say this. The difference is the Constitution of Canada, Justin Trudeau, we are equal. The provincial government is equal with the federal government. We are not subservient. And the municipalities are the sole constitutional authority and responsibility of the provinces. Uh, so what Justin Trudeau is doing is flying in the face. Uh, so we're defending the constitutional authorities there. And when we do things with municipalities, we're still defending the constitutional authority because the constitution says pro provinces have 100% constitutional authority over municipalities. So if, you, if the stay out of lane does the argument doesn't fly because this is our lane. And for me as municipal affairs minister, it's completely my lane. That's what I'm there for. To, to make sure that the legislation and the rules under which municipalities uh, have to operate are the right ones and to make adjustments from time to time, which is what we're doing. So that, that yeah. so on one hand, I suppose you could say what Justin Trudeau wants to do to the provinces is, is uh, it's not the same. It's not the same. It's, it's, it can, it's similar, except that what Justin Trudeau is doing flies right in the face of the constitution and what we're doing is completely in line with the Constitution as it's written. I appreciate that. And my final question to you before I let you go is, what would you want municipal leaders to know about this bill that people aren't talking about right now? Because there are people who listen to this show from across Alberta who are municipal-minded, CAOs, and even municipal leaders. What's the one thing that you would want them to know before you go to just say, okay, before you jump to conclusions, this is what you really need to know? What I want to be true is, and I will work, continue to work very hard to make true, is that the day after this legislation has passed will be pretty much exactly the same as the day before this legislation passed. Okay, 
if, if, if the odd crazy exception crops up, then we'll be able to deal with it quicker. But outside of that, it'll be a day that ends in Y. Municipalities will be in control, municipal councils will be in control of their municipality. They're duly elected and that needs to be respected, uh, including by me, you know, with the slight proviso that under the constitution, I'm still responsible to oversee that. But I don't have time to be the mayor and council of 300 odd municipalities, nor do I want to. And I, I can't imagine what person of any political stripe would want to. So rest easily. I believe that if you're a municipal councillor or a reeve or a mayor, that I believe that your life will be the same the day after this legislation passes, if it does, as it is today. Minister, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to do this. Greatly appreciate it, as always. Chris, very grateful for you taking the time. Thanks. Now, if you've enjoyed this episode, hit that subscribe button now. Stay in the loop with all our diverse content covering everything from municipal affairs like you saw today to our in-depth conversations with municipal leaders on the cross-border interviews or our eye-opening exploration of local governance in the political trenches, local government at work. We are your go-to source for comprehensive municipal coverage committed to keeping you well-informed as well as engaged on what is going on municipally across Canada. Now, we can't do this show without you. So if you can... Consider backing the show. Every contribution, big or small, goes towards amplifying the depth and the breadth of our programming. Find the support page link on the Cross Border Interviews website today. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, but as always, just keep talking.